Translating value, Tokyo, Matsutake, calculator, telephone, still life, at an intermediate wholesaler's booth. Between the dollar and the yen, eight. I have been arguing that commercial mushroom picking exemplifies the general condition of precarity, and in particular of livelihood without regular jobs. But how did we get into a situation in which so few jobs with wages and benefits are available, even in the world's richest country? Worse yet, how do we lose the expectation and taste for such jobs? This is a recent situation. Many white pickers knew such jobs, or at least such expectations, from their earlier lives. Something changed. This chapter makes the bold assertion that the view from a neglected commodity chain can illuminate the surprisingly abrupt and global change. But isn't Matsutake economically negligible? Shouldn't it offer only the view from a frog in a well? On the contrary, the modest success of the Oregon to Japan Matsutake commodity chain is the tip of an iceberg, and following the iceberg to its underwater girth brings up forgotten stories that will grip the plan planet. Things that seem small often turn out to be big. It is the very negligible quality of the Matsutake commodity chain that hid it from the view of 21st century reformers, thus preserving a late 20th century history that shook the world. This is the history of encounters between Japan and the United States that shaped the global economy. Shifting relations between the U.S. and Japanese capital, I argued, led to global supply chains and to the end of expectations of progress aimed toward collective advancement. Global supply chains ended expectations of progress because they allowed lead corporations to let go of their commitments to controlling labor. Standardizing labor required education and regularized jobs, thus connecting profits and progress. In supply chains, in contrast, goods gathered from many arrangements can lead to profits from the lead firm. Commitments to jobs, education, and well-being are no longer, even rhetorically, rhetorically uh, necessary. Supply chains require a particular kind of salvage accumulation, involving translation among, across patches. The modern history of U.S.-Japanese relations is a counterpoint of con response that spread this practice around the world. Two bookends frame the tone. In the mid-19th century, U.S. ships threatened Ido Bay in order to open the Japanese economy for American businessmen. This sparked a Japanese revolution that overturned the national political economy and pushed Japan into international commerce. Japanese refer to the indirect un upending of Japan through the icon of the black ships that carried the U.S. threat. This icon is useful in considering what happened in reverse 150 years later, at the end of the 20th century, when the threat of Japan's commercial power indirectly upended the U.S. economy. Scared by the success of Japanese investments, American business leaders destroyed the corporation as a social institution and propelled the U.S. economy into the world of Japanese-style supply chains. What might call one might call this the reverse black ships. In the great wave of meagers and acquisitions of the 1900s, of the 1990s, with their corporate reshufflings, the expectations that U.S. corporate corporate leaders ought to provide employment disappeared. Instead, labor would be outsourced elsewhere into more and more precarious situations. The Matsutake commodity chain linking Oregon and Japan is just one of many global outsourcing arrangements inspired by the success of Japanese capital between the 1960s and the 1980s. The his this history was quickly covered up. In the 1990s, American businessmen reclaimed preeminence in the world economy, while the Japanese economy fell drastically. By the 21st century, Japanese economic power had been forgotten, and progress, fueled by American ingenuity, appeared to account for the global shift to outsourcing. This is where a humble commodity chain comes in to help us cut through obfuscations. What economic models allowed its organizational forms to emerge? The only way to answer this question is to follow 20th century Japanese economic innovations. These were not created in isolation. They formed from tensions and dialogues across the Pacific. The Matsutake commodity chain places us firmly in U.S.-Japanese economic interactions, and from here we can notice this chunk of forgotten history. In what follows, I let the thread of the story unroll quite far from Matsutake. Yet, at each step, I need the chain's reminders to resist the lull of current erasures. This is not just a story, then, but also a method. Big histories are always best told through insistent, if humble details. 
Money can open the tale. Both the U.S. dollar and the yen came into being in a world dominated by Spanish pesos, minted since the 16th century from the exploitation of Latin American silver. Neither the United States nor Japan were early players, as the United States only came into ex exist existence in the 18th century, and Japan was ruled by inward-looking lords, who strictly regulated foreign trade from the 17th to 19th centuries. The grand futures of neither the dollar nor the yen were evident at their births. By the mid-19th century, however, the dollar had gained the clout of imperial gunboats deployed in its name. U.S. businessmen resented the tight control over foreign trade exerted by the Tokugawa shogunate. <coughs> U.S. whaling interests pushed this initiative, which demanded assistance for U.S. whaling ships. Alan Christie, Personal Communication, 2014. Moby Dick Hansen. In 1853, Matthew Perry, Commodore of the U.S. Navy, took up their cause by leading a fleet of armed ships to Ido Bay. Intimidated by this show of force, the Shogunate signed the Convention of Kanagawa in 1854, which opened ports for U.S. trade. The 1858 Harris Treaty opened more ports, made foreign nationals free from Japanese law, and put foreigners in charge of import-export duties. European powers then imposed similar treaties. Japanese elites were aware of the subjugation of China in the wake of that country's opposition to British free trade opium. To avoid war, they signed away their rights, but domestic crisis followed, resulting in the toppling of the shogunate. A new era opened with a br brief civil war known as the Meiji Restoration. The winning group looked to Western modernity for the inspiration. In 1871, the Meiji government established the yen as a Japanese national currency, intending it to move within European and American circuits. Thus, the dollar indirectly helped give birth to the yen. Meiji era elites were not satisfied, however, to let foreigners control trade. They quickly worked to learn Western conventions and to establish their own firms as domestic equivalents to foreign ones. The government brought in foreign experts and sent young men abroad to study Western languages, laws, and trading practices. The young men came home and established professions, industries, banks, and trading companies, which flourished in Japan's push for the modern. The new money was embedded in new contract laws, political forms, and debates about value. Meiji Japan was full of entrepreneurial energies, and international trade quickly emerged as an important sector of the economy through Kunio Yoshihara, the Japanese Economic Development, Oxford, Oxford University Press, 1994. Tessa Morris Suzuki, A History of Japanese Economic Thought, London, Routledge, 1989. Japan lacked natural resources for industrialization and the importation of raw materials was seen as an essential service for the building of, nation, of the nation. Trading was among the most successful Meiji enterprises, and it became associated with rising new industries such as the production of cotton thread and textiles. Meiji-era traders saw their job as mediating between Japan and the foreign economic worlds. Traders were trained through experience in foreign countries, gaining the doubled cultural agility that allowed them to negotiate across radical differences. Their work exemplifies such concept of translation in which learning another culture both bridges and maintains difference. Satsuka, Nature and Translation, cited in Chapter 4, Number 2. The new traders then how commodities were traded in other places, and they used that knowledge to make advantageous contracts for Japan. In the terms economic economists use, they were specialists in imperfect markets, that is, markets in which information is not freely available to all buyers and sellers. Meiji era traders coordinated markets across national borders. They also worked across incommensurable value systems, as Japanese have continued to imagine a Japan that exists in dynamic difference with something called the West. This understanding of international trading, as translation has persisted, informing contemporary business practices. Trading creates capitalist view values through its work of translation. Meiji era traders associated themselves with industrial enterprises. Industry needed raw materials gained through trade. Trade and industry flourished together. In the early 20th century, century, 
The boom economy associated with World War I allowed larger conglomerates to form, encompassing banking, mining, industry, and foreign trade. Five. Hidemasa Morikawa Zaibatsu, the rise and fall of family enterprise groups in Japan. Tokyo University of Tokyo Press, 1982. In contrast to 20th century U.S. corporate giants, these conglomerates, the Zaibatsu, were coordinated by finance capital, not production. Banking and trading were central to their mission. From the first, they were involved with government business. Mitsui, for example, had provided the money to overthrow the shogunate. Six. E. Herbert Norman, Japan's Emergence as a Modern State, 1940, Vancouver, UBC Press, 2014. In the run-up to World War II, pressed by Japanese nationalists, the Zaibatsu became increasingly entangled with imperial expansion. When Japan lost the war, the Zaibatsu were the first targets of the U.S. occupation. Some 300 Zaibatsu were listed for breakup, but only about 10 were dissolved before the occupation government changed course. Still, regulations were put in place that made pre-war vertical integration difficult to sustain. Alan Christie, Personal Communication, 2014. The Yen lost its value. The Japanese economy was in shambles. In the first day of the occupation, it seemed that the United States was favoring smaller firms and even the advancement of labor. Soon enough, however, the American occupiers arranged for the rehabilitation of once disgraced nationalists and rebuilt the Japanese economy as a bulwark against communism. It was in this climate that associations of banks, industrial enterprises, and specialists in trade formed again, although less formally as Kairitsu Enterprise Groups. Eight. Kenichi Miyashita and David Russell. Kairitsu inside the hidden Japanese conglomerates. New York McGraw Hill, Michael. Gary Lodge, Alliance Capitalism, The Social Organization of Japanese Business, Berkeley, University of California Press, 1992, and The Fable of the Kairatsu, Chicago University of Chicago Press, 2006, Yoshiro Miwa and J. Mark Ramsire, reassert neoclassical orthodoxy and call the Kairatsu a figment of Japanese Marxist and Western Orientalist imaginations. At the heart of most enterprise groups was a general trading company in partnership with a bank. Alexander Young, the Sogo Shosha, Japan's multinational trading companies, Boulder, Colorado, Westby, 1979. Michael Yoshira and Thomas Lipson, The Invisible Link, Japan's Sogo Shosha, and the Organization of Trade, Cambridge, Massachusetts, MIT Press, 1986. Yoshihara, Japanese Economic Development, 4950. The bank transferred money to the trading company, which in turn made smaller loans to its associated enterprises. The bank did not have to monitor these small loans, which the trading company used to facilitate the formation of supply chains. This model is well made to stretch across national borders. Trading companies advance loans or equipment, technical advice, or special marketing agreements to their supply chains over partners overseas. The trading company's job was to translate goods procured in varied cultural and economic arrangements into inventory. It is hard not to see in this arrangement the roots of the current hegemony of global supply chains with their associated form of salvage accumulation. 10. When global commodity chains first came to the attention of American sociologists in the 1980s, Gary Gurphy and Michael Korzenzwitzk, Commodity Chain and Global Capitalism, Westport CT, Greenwood Publishing Group, 1994. They were impressed by the new buyer-driven chains, clothes, shoes, and contrasted them with earlier produce-driven chains, computers, cars, Japanese economic history recommends equal attention to trader-driven chains. I first learned about supply chains and studying logging in Indonesia, and this is a place to see how the Japanese supply chain model works. Eleven. Anna Singh, Friction, Princeton, New Jersey, Princeton University Press, 2005. Peter Taverny, Shadows and the Forest, Japan and the Politics of Timber in Southeast Asia, Cambridge, Massachusetts, MIT Press, 1997, Michael Ross, Timber Bruins and Institutional Breakdown in Southeast Asia, Cambridge, Cambridge University Press, 2009.
During Japan's building boom in the 1970s and 1980s, Japanese imported Indonesian trees to make plywood construction molds, but no Japanese cut down Indonesian trees. Japanese general trading companies offered loans, technical assistance, and trade agreements to firms from other countries, which cut logs to Japanese specifications. This arrangement had many advantages for Japanese traders. First, it avoided political risk. Japanese businessmen were aware of the political difficulties of Chinese Indonesians, who resented for their wealth and willingness to cooperate with the more ruthless policies of the Indonesian government were targets and periodic riots. Japanese businessmen evaded such difficulties for themselves by advancing money to Chinese Indonesians, who made the deals with the Indonesian generals and took the risks. Second, the arrangement facilitated transnational mobility. Japanese traders had already deforested the Philippines and much of the Malaysian Borneo by the time they got to Indonesia. Rather than adapting to a new country, the traders could merely bring in agents willing to work with them in each location. Indeed, Filipino and Malaysian loggers financed by Japanese traders were ready and able to go to work in cutting down Indonesian trees. Third, supply chain arrangements facilitated Japanese trade standards while ignoring environmental consequences. Environmentalists looking for targets could find only a grab bag of varied companies. Many Indonesian, no Japanese, were in the forests. Fourth, supply chain arrangements accommodated illegal logging as a layer of subcontracting, which harvested trees protected by envir environmental regulations. Illegal loggers sold their logs to the larger contractors who passed them on to Japan. No one need to be responsible. And even after Indonesia started its own plywood business, in a supply chain hierarchy modeled on Japanese trade, the wood was so cheap. The cost could be calculated without regard to their lives and the livelihood of loggers, trees, or forest residents. Japanese trading companies made the logging of Southeast Asia possible. They were equally busy with other commodities in other parts of the world. Well, on salmon and chili, see Heather Swasson. Com caught in comparisons, Japanese salmon in an uneven world. PhD dissertation, University of California, Santa Cruz, 2013. Mm -hmm. Let me return to the early post-World War II period when these arrangements were emerging to see how the system developed. Some of the first post-war supply chains from Japan made use of ties with Japan's former colony, Korea. At the time, the United States was the world's richest country and the best destination for every country's wares, but it had imposed a strict quota on goods imported from Japan. Historian Robert Castley tells the story of how Japan helped build South Korea's economy to avoid U.S. quotas. Robert Castley, Korea's Economic Miracle, The Crucial Role of Japan, New York, Palgrave, Macmillan, 1997. By transferring light industry to South Korea, Japanese traders could export more products freely to the United States. Yet, Japanese direct investments was resented in Korea. Thus, Japan adopted what Kasi calls a putting out approach. It involves merchants or firms supplying subcontractors with loans, credit, machinery, and equipment to produce or finish goods, which would be sold in distant markets by the merchant. 14. Castley notes the power of traders and bankers in the strategy. The Japanese offered long-term contracts with overseas suppliers and frequent loans for the developments of resources. 15, 69. This form of expansion, he says, was a form of political as well as economic security. The putting out system transferred less profitable manufacturing sectors and older technologies to South Korea, clearing the way for Japanese businesses to upgrade. According to this model, which Japanese proponents later graced with the image of flying geese, Korean businesses would always be one cycle of innovation behind Japan. 16. Kanoname Akamatsu, a historical pattern of economic growth in developing countries. Journal of Developing Economies, 1 number 1, 1962, page 3 to 25. 
but all would be flying forward, in part because Koreans could then transfer their own outdated manufacturing sectors to the poorer countries of Southeast Asia, allowing Koreans to inherit new rounds of Japanese innovations. South Korean elites were happy to benefit from Japanese capital. Some of it transferred as war rep reparations. The resulting business networks formed models for the transnational expansion of capital in Japan, including the work of the Japanese-controlled Asian development banks. By the 1970s, many kinds of supply chains snaked in and out of Japan. General trading companies organized cross-continental supply chains for raw materials, becoming some of the richest companies in the world. Banks sponsored enterprises across Asia with links to Japan. Meanwhile, producers had organized their own supply chains, sometimes called vertical kairatsu, in the English language literature. Car companies, for example, subcontracted the development and manufacture of uh, parts saving costs. Mom and pop suppliers made industrial components at home. Salvage accumulation and supply chain con subcontracting had grown together. The combined result was so successful that U.S. businesses and their government supporters could feel the heat. The success of Japanese cars was particularly painful to American pundits, who had become used to thinking the U.S. economy was in relation to its cars. The appearance of Japanese cars in the United States and the related decline of Detroit's car companies sparked public awareness of Japan's rising economy fortunes. Some business leaders jumped to learn from Japanese success, showing interest in quality control and corporate culture. Quality control was a part of this transnational dialogue, an American idea that took off in Japan during the American-led rationalization of Japanese industry after World War II. It was re-imported to the United States in the 1970s and 1980s. William M. Tsui Tsui, W. Edwards Deming, and the Origins of Quality Control in Japan, Journal of Japanese Studies, 22 and number 2, 1996, 2 Other business leaders sought U.S. reprisals against Japan. A wave of public fear emerged. One index was the 1982 murder of Chinese-American Vincent Chen, mistaken for a Japanese by unemployed white auto workers in Detroit. For an example of U.S. anti-Japanese economic journalism for this period, see Robert Perrin's Saibatsu America, How Japanese Firms Are Colonizing Vital U.S. Industries, New York, Free Press, 1992. The threat posed by Japan unleashed a U.S. revolution. Reverse black ships overturned the U.S. order of things, but through U.S. effort, empowered by public fears of U.S. decline, a small group of activists, stockholders, and business school professors who might otherwise have never gained a hearing were allowed to dismantle American corporations. My analysis is inspired by Karen Ho, liquidated during the North Carolina Duke University Press, 2009. The activists of the 1980s shareholders' revolution and reacted to what they saw as the erosion of U.S. power. To regain it, they aimed to take back corporations for their owners, the stockholders, rather than leaving them in the hands of professional managers. They began to buy up corporations to strip them of assets and resell them. By the 1990s, the movement had won. The radical chic of leveraged buyouts became the mainstream investment strategy of <sighs> mergers and acquisitions. As corporations rid themselves of all but their most profitable sectors, most of what had once been inside those corporations was contracted to distant suppliers. Supply chains and this commitment to their distinctive form of salvage accumulation took off as a dominant form of capitalism in the United States. This worked so well for investors that by the time of the century, U.S. business leaders had forgotten that this shift was part of a struggle for U.S. position and had recast it as the leading edge of an evolutionary process. They were busy cramming the world into this process and had indeed made headway in enforcing an American version in Japan. For an example of U.S. style reforms promoted by Japanese economists, see Hiroshio Hiroshi Yoshikawa, Japan's Last Decade. Translated Charles Stewart. Long term credit bank of Japan International Trust Library Se Selection 2. Tokyo International House of Japan, 2002. The book argues that the small and medium sized corporations are a drain on the economy.
understand how Japan's threat had faded requires going back a bit and allowing money to emerge as the protagonist of the story. In the 1980s and 1990s, lots of things shifted because of confrontations between the dollar and the yen. In 1949, the yen was pegged to the US dollar as part of the Brenton Woods Agreements. As the Japanese economy flourished and part through anonymous reciprocated exports to the United States, the US balance was undervalued making Japanese goods cheap in the United States and U.S. exports to Japan to do anything. U.S. anxieties about the yen were one small part of the situation in 1971. That led to the U.S. abandonment of the gold standard. In 1973, the yen was allowed to flow. Then in 1979, the U.S. raised interest rates, attracting investments in the dollar and keeping its value high. Because the Japanese econo economy continued to export to the United States, the Japanese government bought and sold U.S. dollars to keep the price of the yen low. In the first half of the 1980s, capital flowed out of Japan, keeping the yen weak in relation to the dollar. By 1958, U.S. business leaders had panicked about the situation. In response, the U.S. engineered an international agreement, the Plaza Accorded. The value of the dollar was lowered and the yen rose. By 1988, the yen had doubled its value in relation to the dollar. Japanese consumers would buy almost everything abroad, including Wasitake. However, the situation made it difficult. National pride rose. This was the moment of the Japan that can say no. Shintaro Ishihara, the Japan that can say no, translated Frank Baldwin with Akio Morita, New York Touchdown Books, 1992. However, the situation made it difficult for Japanese companies to export their goods, which were now priced too high. Japanese companies responded by sending more production abroad. So did their suppliers in South Korea, Taiwan, and Southeast Asia, also reeling from the change in currency values. Supply chains traveled everywhere. Here's how two immigrant sociologists describe the situation. Faced with the sudden increase of the dollar value of the factory inputs and eager to keep their prices low and thus maintain their contracts and American retailers, Asian businesses quickly began to diversify. Most of Taiwan's light industries moved to mainland China, but also to Southeast Asia. Large segments of Japanese export-oriented industries moved to Southeast Asia. In addition to some firms such as Toyota, Honda, and Sony established portions of their business in North America. South Korea businesses also moved labor-intensive operations to Southeast Asia as well as to other developing countries in Latin America and Central Europe. In each place that they established their new businesses, low-price supply networks began to form. 23. Petrovic Gain Hamilton, Making Global Markets Save in Chapter 4, Number 7. The Japanese national economy went into shock, first with the bubble economy of inflated real estate and stock prices in the late 1980s, then the last decade of recession in the 1990s, then the further financial crisis of 1997. According to Robert Brenner, The Boom, the reverse pause accord of 1995, in which world power stopped the ascent of the yen, triggered a shift in the world's economy by both killing U.S. manufacturing and triggering the Asian financial crisis. <coughs> but supply chains took off as never before, not just Japanese smart sponsored chains, but chains from all Japan's supplier sites, which now had their own chains. Supply chain capitalism became a presence around the world, but Japan was no longer in charge. One company's history supply changes it shows the change between Japanese and US leadership of global supply chains. Like the non trading brand of athletic shoes, Nike began as a US outpost of a Japanese distribution chain for athletic shoes. Distribution is an element of many J Japanese supply chains. Subject to the disciplines of the Japanese trading regime, Nike learned that the supply chain would model, but Nike slowly began to transform it, American style. Instead of making value through trade as a translation, Nike would use the American advantages in advertising and branding. 
When Nike's founders established their independence from their Japanese chain, they added style in the form of the Nike Swoosh and advertisements featuring black American sports heroes. Learning from their Japanese experience, however, it never occurred to them to manufacture shoes. We don't know the first thing about manufacturing. We are marketers and designers, explained Nike Vice President 25. Instead, they contracted with their proliferating supply networks, developing across Asia, making good use of the 1958 profusion of low supply price supply networks mentioned above by the early 21st century. The company had contacts with more than 900 factories, and it had become a symbol of both the excitement and terror of supply chain capitalism. To speak of Nike evokes the horrors of sweatshops, and on the one hand, and the pleasures of designer brands on the other. Nike had succeeded in making this contradiction seem particularly American, but Nike's rise from Japanese supply chains remind us of the pervasive legacy of Japan. That legacy is clear in the Matsutake supply chain, too small and too specialized to attract the intervention of American big business. Yet, the chain stretches to North America, enrolling Americans as suppliers rather than as chain directors. Nike on its head. How are American convinced to take on such a lowly role? As I have explained, no one in Oregon thinks of him or herself as an employee of a Japanese business. The pickers, buyers, and field agents are there for freedom. But freedom has come to mobilize the poor only through the freeing of American livelihoods from expectations of employment, a result of the Trans-Pacific Dialogue between U.S. and Japanese capital. In the Matsutake commodity chain, then, we see the history I have been describing. Japanese traders searching for local partners, American workers released from the hope of regular jobs, translations across aspirations, following American freedom to assemble Japanese in inventory. I have been arguing that the organization of the commodity chain allows us to notice this history, which otherwise might be obscured by hype about U.S. global leadership. When humble commodities are allowed to eliminate big histories, the world economy is revealed as emerging within historical conjectures, the indeterminacies of an encounter. If conjectures make history, everything rests on moments of coordination. The translation that allows Japanese investors to profit from American foraging, just as pickers take advantage of Japanese health. Higher mushrooms that are foraged for freedom, transformed into inventory. I return to open ticket and its commodity chain.